to the projector. Mm -hmm. So who, whose light is that? Okay, can you dim these lights too? Or do you want me to turn that switch? <laughs> it's too simple. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> The start of the problem and the thing that enlists most Americans is congestion, traffic jams. You are not part of the jam, you are the jam, as the German public transportation system says it. Um, bumper to bumper, holiday traffic at the Portland Turnpike. Getting there is not half the fun, and a lot of people are beginning to realize that. <laughs> And how did we get that way? This is a Detroit picture. Of these pictures and the captions are from the book. Um, the architecture, the landscape of the exit ramp at the Detroit Theater filled, used as a parking lot. And the book is quite Detroit oriented. I won't single it out as I go through, because this area has been, in the history and in some of the, the problems, has been a kind of vanguard, if one can use that in the sense of ahead of the pack rather than any positive suggestion in terms of it was their firstest with the worstest in terms of decimating the city and following the lead of the auto industry. Um, but we have built this landscape of the exit ramp not because we're malevolent, not because we really would sit there and say Let, let's trash this theater, but because of the dictates of the automobile. It's a very simple planning equation. The equation is that every automobile requires three parking spaces, one at home in the driveway, one for work, and one for uh, the mall. And the rest is just getting around uh, in motion. And that's why we have cities that are, when they're good and viable, 30% covered with asphalt. When they're not so viable, they're 50 or 60% covered with asphalt. And somebody will have to do their geographical whiz uh, in space to figure out what it is for Detroit, but that's basically an environment we live in. And as I was going through this book, I spoke to a landscape architect, and he said to me, um, you know, you picked the right word. What word? You know, asphalt nation took back. He said, asphalt. He said, because if I had to pick the most destructive environmentally in every other sense material and say, what am I going to hard top the universe with, it would be asphalt. And we, of course, have 40,000 square miles of asphalt in this country. And we've based our environment on the automobile with the perception that objects in the mirror are especially breathtaking, designed for cars, not for human beings. Here's a picture um, of a planner's vision of the universe. It's the American Planning Association cover issue on Detroit last year in which they are showing the auto age. And this is a picture of the geography of no place, the geography of nowhere, any place USA, but it's, we have gotten so everything's like a dream in Kansas City, they've gone about as far as they can go. You know, the tower and the high rise are defining what the city is about. They're not picking the colorful aspects of either the waterfront or the downtown, uh, but they are picking this kind of image of the automobile and the airplane. Does this feel like it's in focus to you all? No. Okay. Okay. Is that any better? There are so many buttons here. This is a wonderful machine. Are you going to do this for me? That's it, okay. Oh, it's I, that's why I asked them. Okay, I think you have a better view than I do. I'll have to go out and watch it. Um, so what do we build when we come around to building real cities? This is Universal City in Los Angeles, and what they did to build this 
sampler of a city, this theme park of a city, was take all the high identifiable parts of Los Angeles, which is hard to do in one city form, but they took a delicatessen here, a flower store here, uh, the sidewalk they embedded with chewing gum for realism, I guess, a photographic store. And they called it Universal City, and people come and visit it. They go up the hill in Los Angeles. They go up the hill, however, not on foot. They go up the hill in their cars, park in a garage that totally surrounds this mall of a city. And that's what we've done. That's sort of metaphorically what we've done to our cities with our automobiles. And we have led, bred a geography of inequity. This, again, is Detroit, um, where 9% of our households have no automobile. The difference between work and welfare is very often that lack of transportation. And the reason that it's so important to take these breakdowns of how the automobile is used, who has a car and who doesn't have one, and how we get around is the perception that came to me in the five years that I did this book. I started fresh minted in a way. I only knew what I've just said to you about the automobile, but I knew coming from a walking city that the automobile was not my mo prime center of mobility that the streetcar was. And looking through a cost, the argument that I believe in and had to develop was this isn't something that is making us free. Because we are a nation, we have more cars than people, or 200 million cars and almost as many cars as people, but we are not free because of those 9% those nine of our households. We're not free because we have 55 million school-aged children who are totally incapable of the mobility I knew, or even my kids knew, living in a city where they were maneuverable on foot before 16 in their license. Elderly people, almost the same number, over 60, the fastest growing age skew in the population who can't move without an automobile. I mean, inconvenience and tragedy. And then in between, of course, you have soccer mom doing two thirds of the driving soccer dad, one third, and they are racing their wheels, taking um, a couple of tons of rolling wheel and steel, now that we have sports utility vehicles, and driving the 20,000 plus vehicle to the store to buy a quart of milk. So that's not my definition of freedom, or of mobility, actually. And it also has, as we all know, a, a roster of environmental problems. And they begin with the, the harm to our personal health and breath, which I think is very well publicized, and we all know. Um, here's some actually pregnant dummies. I guess that's <laughs> a little bit of a contradiction in terms <laughs> if you can't be a dummy and pregnant, but um, pseudo-pregnant drivers um, being tested in one of these ways that the automobile makers um, exult as being the, refined, the refinements in our safety. Um, but, of course, it is not a refinement. We have 120 people killed a day, 40,000 plus a year. And again, in this kind of gobbledygook language, the articles you, you see and read say that we have made vast advances in uh, safety because we're driving many more miles, true, and yet we're not killing any more people than we did before. We're still killing a mere 40,000 people, the size of a decent a small town. It's a, it's a little like another argument that I heard when I was doing something on noise and trying to find some studies about the problems of noise from automobiles and highways. And, and I called one of the automobile kind of resource companies and I said, um, do you have any statistics on problems with noise in the automobile? And they said, oh yes, we have volumes and volumes, what would you like? And I said, well, can you just tell me uh, what you've done about it and how you affect it. And he said, oh, sure. He said, we pad the seats, we double glaze the windows, we cover the, the uh, front window, they, we do the rooftop. And I said, no, no, I don't mean for the driver, I mean for the people impacted by the cars in the road. Oh, he said. You know, that is that same sense of um, objects in the mirror. It's a view from the windshield. It's a windshield view that defines all the aspects of life by how the automobile goes. Uh, interestingly enough, th this um, figure is 
a device that the New York um, transportation advocates have done every time somebody is killed on the street by an automobile, they um, do a kind of a graffiti of it, a guerrilla graffiti activity, since of course it's illegal. Um, well, that kind of personal injury tailpipe material that we've learned to know um, is what affects us in our daily lives. And this, of course, is what's happening in our planet. Global warming. Um, before global warming, uh, the conference in Kyoto, I wrote a piece for the nation saying, you know, whatever is going to come out of the global warming conference, you can be pretty sure that not much is going to come out in the way of uh, charging A or B or whatever. Uh, villain in the piece, our automobiles cause almost half of global warming. Two, we have uh, 200 million cars, half the fleet of 400, and the prospects for that other 400 on the planet growing bigger are dismayingly large, of course, on the international scene. And nothing particularly came out of it in the way of <coughs> dealing with the automobile as this agent of destruction, unless, of course, you call GM having a green charade um, auto show and a lot of proclamations about putting together cars that are clean. Um, you know, there is no free lunch, there is no clean car. Uh, the automobile in both its emissions, even if they're down to nil, and its production, its use of resources, its destruction of, of habitat, which is the prime cause, it's the prime destroyer of habitat, which is the prime destroyer of species, and on and on through the whole <coughs> litany of environmental injuries caused by the automobile. Well, rather than repeating all this, which I think is not new to any of us here, um, my way of getting at it, both for me and for anybody who read it in a book that was supposed to be um, not just another little set of CO2 kinds of, uh, C2O kinds of uh, monograms, was to go to two sides, two ends of the country, east coast and west coast, to pick out relatively minute, seemingly minute aspects of the problem of the automobile and then multiply them by 200 million cars. And one of them was a salt heap in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which provides the salt for New Hampshire's road, our New England's uh, live free or die state. And examining that, just that little aspect of the winter clearing, um, to see what was happening with that salt, which was all the way from getting into the waters, eroding the bridges, and at, in the end, um, taking responsibility for the decline in roadside tree species, and on and on and on. And, you know, that is something salt is, is the most benign material. And then I moved to the West Coast um, to the world's largest tire dump in Tracy, California, which was definitely film material, um, road warrior material, and quite surreal because we, sa we shed 40 million tires a year, um, one of our tires. And as we shed them, of course, not only do they make for insect breeding, fire catching heaps of wasted, despoiled pieces of land, but the surfaces of the tires, of course, the lead, the benzene, all, all the parts of the tire, um, toxic or at worst non, uh, unhelpful to the environment, um, go across the landscape of the nation. And I went from there to just even a, microco a microcosm of the macrocosm, a microcosm of the microcosm of the microcosm, if you can follow that, to another little town called Santa Clara, California, which was having, which had had a fire in their small, very small kind of dump, a couple hundred thousand tires, and there was a big lawsuit about it. But what had happened is these kind of renegade operators had neglected the place, it caught fire, amazing, it's like an oil fire because of course it's made of oil, consumes oil, spread all over the sky, sent the kids indoors, the elderly indoors, brought the fire trucks, the fire trucks came, shot the burning flames and smoldering tires with a mix of chemicals. The chemicals then washed off this mess into the Russian River. The Russian River headed north 
to Sonoma Valley where our wine is made and we may be drinking the corollary or the, <laughs> the refuse of these fire, fire um, charred tires and chemicals. Um, now this is a little bit holistic seamless, seamlessness of environmental pollution, but I think it's um, so fractional, these little things, and it's going on across the country because of the bulk and the multitude of the automobiles we produce. Careful, you may be running out of planet. So what is the cost? This is the hard-boiled part of this book. Um, what is the cost of the automobile? We all know, um, and we hear, certainly hear from the automakers about our dependency, one out of six workers, et cetera, et cetera, but do we know the cost? I mean, do we know that half our gross domestic product, 18% of our, excuse me, 18% of our gross domestic product goes to the automobile more than schools? Um, twice as much as the Europeans spend because, partly because they're smaller, but partly because they have four and five dollar gas taxes that enables them to build a really decent public transportation system. This is the Century Freeway and Highway. Uh, Century Freeway, the last completed massive uh, roadway uh, I ha we have in Boston. I shouldn't say I have personally, uh, even though I am suffering from our massive, massive highway, uh, $11 billion project to send computers from the North Shore under the city to the South Shore and back again. Uh, that's totally turned up, uh, total up upheaval in our town. But this is the cost of the car culture, $300 billion in federal expenses given over to private transportation, the automobile, $3.5 billion to public transportation. And then people say, we love our cars, we choose our cars. Well, we choose our cars, and some love or some have love-hates relationships with the cars, because an auto-dependent society has immobilized every other way of moving. Personally, in terms of our immediate expenses, we spend $6,500 a year on our automobiles. Um, that's, an, uh, that, that's a big chunk of cash when you consider that more than half our households have two or three cars in their garages. And I think people do not do these equations. I did the equations because I was writing this book. I sold my car. I knew I had, doing the math, $25 a day. And that gave me a kind of mobility. It gave me more mobility, clearly, in a Boston than to other people in other parts of the country. But it certainly um, is something to reckon with as you're advancing onto your second or third car. In addition to the personal expenses, the figures are three to $5,000 in social expenses all the way from the register of the police station, the fire station, to the environmental malaise. It's a figure that I think, like any number of these figures, I think I, I took the low estimate because I just uh, didn't want to get caught on an overflate, overinflating the numbers. But how much does global warming cost? How much does the black sky in the Tracy fire and the Santa Clara fire dump cost? And how much does our oil dependency cost? Um, according to Randy Arendt, half of our oil budget goes oily beast. This is back when we were having the Persian Gulf War, but of course we're in Iraq now, and what are we paying for our oil dependency even as the oil supplies dry, dry up? So business news, economic growth indicators are up, led by car repairs, divorce cases, open heart surgeries, and toxic waste cleanups. Many of them caused by the automobile, I, I should add. So the automobile came, saw, consumed, instant gratification. And how did it get that way? In addition to dealing with the automobile and becoming aware that the myth of the car being totally freeing was basically untrue for any portion of the population, the other kind of cliche of indeterminism, if you will, of non-planning was, is that we adore our automobiles, we have the urge for the open road, and it is this primal, put the pedal to the metal instinct that is driving us to drive more miles and to move out further and further into the springes, to sprawl across 
2 million acres of farmland a year, 12,000 in Michigan, I'm told. So how did we get this way? The point of doing the history, the car tracks, tracing the history of the automobile becomes very apparent that we have subsidized our way, we have deferred to the automobile, we have taken the dictates of one singular form of mobility, the automobile, not public transportation, not walking, not biking, nothing else. And this is what substantiated to me the case that the car was needed to pay its way and the fact that it didn't pay its way is why it was so generally established here. This is Pennsylvania Station and this was part of what drew me to the book. This was the great cause of the early preservation uh, era. It was a, a great turning point when it was torn down. It emerged as a kind of architectural masterpiece, certainly, but more than that, it was symbolic to me of how we, at one point, romanced and, and enhanced and created public spaces for the entire society. We created a public realm that was satisfying sharing a kind of spiritual community about transportation and about being together. We have none of that. I mean, I-94, <laughs> get your kicks on I-94. That's the public realm, realm that we all know today. And this is what we destroyed. And at one time, along, along with it, went this kind of streetcar. This is West Virginia. Even the most rural parts of America had a kind of streetcar system. You could get uniformly, I think there was one stretch unconnected someplace in the Middle West, but if between rail, streetcar, and interurban, the big red cars of um, taken for a ride, if you've ever seen that video that tells about the national city line GM taking takeover of uh, the streetcar lines for their bus system, before this history ensued, you could get across the country this way. Well, in 1908, the Model T came, the machine for the masses, and in the same era as the model city. I mean, the words are parallel, but the, the sentiment is very interesting because it was from that period of the turn of the century and this grand building that the automobile emerged, and very soon thereafter, the car took over. There is not a city in the United States, and I had never thought about this myself, having written about cities for 20 years, that there is not a city in the United States that was created, or in many cases grew, in an urban city way after 1920 when the car culture dominated America. And I, I don't consider, I mean, places like Houston and Los Angeles had a texture and a fabric and they were a city. As when the car came, that cityness, that walkability vanished and we had a different kind of, you can call it edge city, you can call it megalopolis, but we're not talking cities in the sense that those of us who care about cities as centers of civility, if you will, um, not one of those endured after this period of total deference to the automobile. And in the 20s, we went from front porch to front seat. And this kind of congestion that was rampant in any number of American cities with the, pro with the public trolley, quote, it was always, always the streetcar that was crowding the cars out. It was always get rid of the streetcar bandits, the traction magnets became the traction bandits, and they were no, you know, really a great public saviors, but the automobile was always seen as the way to go. And, and you know, it's a, you have about in that line of all those cars could, pro the ca passengers in all those cars could probably fit in one streetcar. And that's exactly the same kind of formulaic approach to the public car versus, uh, the private car versus public transportation that held, but nonetheless, the car gained dominance, the kind of quiet front porch architecture and life disappeared. And through every period in our nation's history, even the periods that we don't think of, we recognize the interstate as the time when the automobile took dominance from 1956. But as I researched this, it became very clear that the New Deal with its WPA jobs, its, you know, relieving the nation, taking uh, people off the dole and back to work. Half those jobs were pick and shovel jobs devoted to the automobile, building roads for all the parks, for all the 
pub, the, all the aspects uh, that we've learned to admire in some of these projects, this was what was done, and this was boosting the auto age. And even at the time that we were boosting the auto age in these roads, we had a sensitivity to our landscape. It was not like the straightest distance between two points across America with green and white signs. This is the Merritt Parkway, and you can see that it's respecting the landscape. I mean, speed was not the prime mission. It was certainly, it was a limited access highway, but it deferred to the landscape. The governor of Connecticut, it said, kept a tree in the way, moved the highway to go around the tree because, he said, he liked the tree. It was a nice tree, and I liked it. Um, World War II, the same kind of situation. Even though we were riding on the rails, we weren't allowed to drive because there was no rubber. We needed the manufacturing uh, GM and all the uh, car companies to build the munitions effort. It was still a time that eventually saw the erosion of the automobile because in the first place, public transportation was jammed and ill-maintained. And in the second place, government policy said that these new plants would be going to the fringes, to the northwest, to the west, to the south, away from the cities, to new areas that then took off after the war and became fringe, non-urban places as our anti-urban policy developed. At the same time, those people in the federal government who were running the war effort were the leadership and bureaucracy of the auto industry, further ensuring that we would have an auto-dependent, auto concerned uh, political process. So World War II ended, the asphalt exodus began. This is the 1939 World Fair dream of the future, which happened. We headed out with VA mortgages of $500. You could buy a new house. Levittown's emerged out in the green fields, as we now call them. FHA, federal subsidies for the single family home. All these institutional structures, these subsidies that ensure if not the car and the highway, then the car culture to this day. Levittown, California style, not actually Levittown, but populating the nation, populating our living rooms. Um, this is from House Beautiful, and it was the living room of the future where you would park your car um, right next to your, I guess they call them settees, those uh, sofas at the time. And nobody seemed to think of it as a, an artifact that might have some polluting, dirty elements that you wouldn't want in the living room, but there it was. And we're now entering the period of both um, the interstate and urban renewal, combining to decimate the cities by the flight and by the destruction for the automobile within the cities. So this is moved around the corner part of Boston's West End, which was a classic in decimation, and the Portland Terminal. Uh, sy symbolic of so many of these pictures. I mean, you could, do, uh, you could do a book of just the ruins coming down. I did a book of what had been destroyed, but they were much more, called Lost Boston, but they were much more attractive. They were not these uh, crumbling walls. And we instead had what Lewis Mumford called the four-leaf clover culture. Well, there was a little hiatus in this whole kind of rack and ruin. And uh, this is a cartoon by Draper Hill, whom some of you may know who worked on the Detroit News, an old colleague of mine. Um, as it's of the period, dear leader, is your city suffering from hardening of the arteries dangerously low levels of chlorophyll, elephantiasis as a parking facility, or rampant hindsight, preservation before it's too late. And of course, 25 years ago, we had Earth Day, we had legislation for clean air, clean water, a whole slew. We had a lot of books bashing the automobile. In the 70s, there must have been seven or eight books that were um, uh, very parallel to one do what I'm doing, super highway, uh, super hoax, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, none of them offered solutions. That's the only thing that saves me from not being abjectly depressed about writing more of the same when things have gotten worse. Um, we had, at the time, an oil crisis. We had 50 mile an hour speed limits. 
But what happened is that the, we ran the wheel in reverse, so to speak. This is what I call the quintessential architecture of the exit ramp. Um, uh, is it, you can, this is Danbury, Connecticut, which uh, you may know from its glorious environmental history, um, which was, like any number of other corporations, was in downtown New York, or a, in a city, as so many others were. Um, the federal government paid for that. We paid for that highway to take them out there and build this corporate headquarters. So you could go off the exit ramp. There was a, a humongous exit ramp built for this thing. So you could go up that um, sloping driveway from the highway and hit the top of the roof, descend, and never touch the earth. Um, and from this moment, this was sort of symbolic of the great American sprawl that characterized America, that we would have these inviolate areas. As Woody Allen put it, um, my feet haven't touched pavement since I reached LA. And there we have the three-car culture installed in Sun City, the one use, in this case, elderly community where everything demanded an automobile. One use, zoned for housing only, no commercial, no mixed, a kind of car demanding environment that characterizes that whole wave of new building that gave, caused us to have our deer crossings become deer crossing condominiums. And our malls uh, our semi-compact malls become Tyson's corner, the corner, the quintessential edge city where you have to get in your automobile at lunch hours or to cross from Tiffany's to Neiman's. Onerous for rich and poor like an equal opportunity car dependency. Um, so what we have here is a summary of what Americans are driving from the 1960s gas guzzler to the 1970s a beetle, about to be in your front yard, I suppose, these days, um, the stretch limo from the age of developers and the tank from the Persian Gulf War feeding the system. And today, of course, um, the sports utility vehicle, which um, adding its own um, voracious appetite to the Americans' gas guzzling impulse. And we're going faster than ever, fastest state in the West. So this is a call for help. Um, and there are solutions, but we can get out of that zero. It's time for real solutions, not this kind of highway structure. Why build roads if they simply generate traffic? They are building roads across the country. They're widening, they're widening bridges, they're widening roads, they're planning a national highway system. They have been doing this since 1920, and the if you build it, they will come mentality is not only fairly well penetrating our society, but it's based on mathematical equations that we've learned to appreciate um, both through computers and through common sense. But we still have all this material coming out of the upstate, the shells and the upstate engineers who want to just um, pave over the universe. Um, the solution to being car free from dead end to exit uh, is multifold, and it, uh, it's a political solution in a lot of ways, and it depends on both certain kinds of activities and certain kinds of activ activists to make these policies real. And this is, I began with the bicyclists who were the most militant and out there and very vociferous and very engaging in their um, kinds of approach to making what they want public. But above all, it's a solution that says, not to sound like Nancy Reagan, just say no. None for the road. This is West Virginia again, where they have a very large pork barrel project courtesy Sen Senator Byrd, and a rural landscape that is totally beautiful and totally unpopulated. Um, I saw very few cars as we were driving along um, 
and an activist group there, we were driving along and she was playing a tape that some of the folk singers had made, including going down the road feeling bad and a number of other kind of wrenching things. So the solutions are definitely personal and I think they stem from some of the statistics I've mentioned about who and how and what we do with the automobile, but it comes from the realization, not only the cost and the environmental damage, but how we use our motor vehicles. And we use our motor vehicles in ways that we don't quite recognize. I mean, if I were to ask most people how or why they need an automobile or two or three, they would say, I need it to get to work, I can't get to work without it, I like it to take on trips, that's why I have car one, two, three. Uh, in fact, our work trip is 19% of the vehicle miles we travel and our trips, vacations, is 8%. The rest of it is two-thirds of the miles that we put on the automobile, you know, four trips a day, door open, door shut, is what I call the romance of shop and drop, the romance of the road. And that means about half that two-thirds is spent on chauffeuring, picking up mothers, picking up kids, getting here and there, getting to driving our cars to the club so we can work out on the treadmill. Um, the other third is shopping, taking this, um, you know, sports utility vehicle on steroids um, to uh, the Home Depot to save a dollar on a hammer. <laughs> so I think that, it, you know, it's a question of knowing we have $25 a day and can we spend it in a better way? And Some of us are more extreme about this than others. <laughs> uh, that's the drama. This is the pragmatics of the whole situation. Most of our trips are a mile or two. 30% are one mile or less. Just under 40, three miles or less. Just under 50, five miles or less a very, very manageable kind of trip on foot in the first instance and on bike in all these incidents. And why don't we do it? Um, we don't do it because it's fun to go to the drugstore for that popsicle. That's really archaic. I shouldn't say the drugstore, the Costco or CVS, whatever is your local chain. And we don't do it because it's fun. We do it because we can't get there any other way. And why can't we get there? Well, we certainly can't get there because we have no good public transportation, but in a more nitty-gritty way, we can't get there because it's a disgusting trip. It's a trip that's filled with roads and parking lots and massive streets that you can't cross because there are no stoplights, and it's ugly and brutalizing. And there are things to do about that kind. There's traffic calming, there's boulevard makeovers, there's any number of ways of getting trips under a mile, and a lot of them are zoning and planning so that we no longer have those single-use suburbs. And this is my city, um, which is doing its best to uh, dismiss its famous name as the walking city. And some New Yorkers you may have read, I don't know if you followed the um, it was in The Economist and any number of other places, Mayor Gi Giuliani, I mean, New York is a major, major walking city, and put a, they put up barriers so the pedestrians, when they were at a four-way crossover, couldn't cross. So they would have to walk like two blocks down Fifth Avenue and circle back. And transportation alternatives, basically a bicycling organization, but militant again, uh, did this parading around. Pedestrians are not cattle. They had this Cowan, where, which is very colorful, and people wrote to the paper. I mean, there's a real constituency out there for people who say, especially in a place like New York where everybody's walking, what's safer and what's the way to go. And again, the bicycle route, that one less car, used both in terms of, of kids getting to school, a very, very, one of the more poignant pieces um, of my kind of saga through all this was running into people who would say to me, when I was a boy, especially in the bicycling aspects, I could bike to school. I had a lot of mobility. Now there's so much traffic, 
that I can't do it. Um, and a lot of people said when I was a kid, I could get around and go to, get on a streetcar and go places before I got the magic license at age 16. And I saw this with my own kids. When everybody talks about freedom and mobility and becoming an adult, um, my daughters became an adult. Um, I was totally terrified, but they became an adult by taking the streetcar downtown. And they were like nine or ten, and I, you know, loaded them with, with I was going to say quartered, loaded them with dimes to put in the phone booth as soon as they got to the Boston Public Library, but they were grown-ups at a very early age and not dependent. And bicycles, uh, the capacity to bike and walk is extremely important to human beings, and it can become, as it has been in some other university cities, a way of deli making delivery services to people who are then freed of having the need for the automobile to do all their chores and errands. But I think all of this depends on a policy of centering. We have had a policy of decentralizing, of everything going outwards. But unless you can have a hub and a certain amount of density, and I'm not talking like a, a high rise on every corner, but just the older inner suburbs, where it were, or even the better places that we now want to live, our Georgetowns, our San Francisco's, all these kinds of places, by having that kind of environment and by not trashing inner cities and moving outwards and taking our industries out and our housing out, we then become able to afford public transportation. One of the gifts of the public transportation system when it was working in the early century was, uh, I mean, the basic truth of a, of a streetcar system is that it is actually money-making in, in the city and in the denser areas five days a week. When it isn't money-making, because you have the same built-in infrastructure courses, uh, costs, is on the weekends. And what our, an earlier generation did, I mean, it was economically efficient and astute. They said, okay, we're going to build amusement parks at the end of the streetcar line, and I think probably anybody my age, I, I would imagine, or who's been in most of America's cities, can remember an amusement park at the end of the streetcar line. And the wonderful thing about that was that every weekend you did not have to, you know, get in your car and go wherever you were going. If you were an auto mogul, you could go, you'd be now going to, I guess, Mackinac Island where they have no automobiles. But you could stay in a confined place and, and live a life. And the streetcar was efficient and life was efficient and, and pleasanter in a lot of ways. Well, there are a number of ways, and I'll only do, there's 100 pages here of ways, but some of them for this centering aspect of centering are reviving our main streets and making sure that there's a policy in place that restricts subsidizing the outward course of the automobile to our Walmarts, our Sprawlmarts, and the 4,000 dead malls that you see around our communities. This is Leesburg, Virginia, an especially attractive main street, but I think the same policy applies in lots of places across the country. It's been extremely successful reviving those places, but we had, in some ways we have to put a grip on the scattered large developments, and part of that issue is an issue not only of centering, but of developing a kind of, the kind of regionalism that I imagine you, you in planning have heard about that makes a fusion, an alliance perhaps, of cities and inner suburbs and the region and enables them to cooperate with one another so that if the Walmart gets beaten down in X town, it can't just go to the next town, get a bribe for the next town, and settle in. And that applies to corporations, too, in, in both the small and the large picture, the war between the states that you see with the automobile industry, or the war between the continents, if you will. Our waterfronts are one area where we, this is Battery Park City in New York, where there's been a lot of movement to fix up, strengthen, fortify, make walkable. And of course the new urbanism, which you've heard about in your classes, I imagine, um, which has been a very compelling movement to make housing as we build our subdivisions or as we refurbish, hopefully, our subdivisions a part of, a reflective of the social life of America, which is not the nuclear family, the Aussie and Harriet lifestyle with two parents and two kids. Part of the reason we have more cars and we have more sprawl is because we can only move and build in one way. Um, 
I spoke to Peter Calthorpe, who is one of the new urbanist leaders in the course of doing this book, a planner, and he said to me, um, if I had one thing that I would want to do, it would, do, it would be to build granny flats. <laughs> and I said, it was like plastics, granny flats, um, because that, those little garages or whatever, with the studio about them, whether it's a, a young person or an older person, but serving all the various needs and various lifestyles in various fashions. This is the old urbanism, or kind of quasi-suburbanism. It's the three-decker house, and it's just put there as a kind of, as my teachers used to say, put on your thinking cap as planners, architects, builders. This was a wonderful housing form. It was um, three floor throughs, windows on four sides, ownership on the first floor, and then uh, rentals on the other two floors. It was the kind of immigrant worker, middle class, you know, incoming immigrant worker, middle class preferred form of housing. Um, I had a review in the Los Angeles Times by Joel Garreau, who wrote Edge City, and he said, to, um, Jane Holtz K hates Los Angeles. That was the first line. And the second line was, she hates it. And the third line was, she hates it. <laughs> and I actually hadn't said too many pleasant things about his book, but that, that's another story. People, <laughs> some people disqualify themselves in these, these things. And I wanted to write them a letter and say, hey guys, it's not me who hates Los Angeles. I didn't mess up your cobalt blue waters or your you know, shiny bright skies, it's you. Um, but the point was, that relates to this, he said, she meaning me, even likes that tenement form of housing called the three-decker. Well, that tenement form of housing in Cambridge, Massachusetts is now going for $150,000 a floor. So I think, you know, both in commercial and personal terms, there's a market for co-housing, collective housing, assisted living housing. We're seeing all kinds of housing forms put out by the market. And I think it should be more coordinated and developed and thought through by people in concerned with having this kind of density zoning centering that will enable us to live lives on foot and not be so dependent on our automobiles. Um, this is the kind of poster city, Portland, Oregon, that is the most dramatic case study of a city that decided its destiny was not to be a highway that was going to go near the waterfront and do one of those dreadful things that happened in any number of cities. So they used the Highway Transfer Act of 20 or 30 years ago, which was a predecessor to ISTE, our own federal bill that enables us to use half our federal monies for non-automotive transportation. And in t instead, they used the money to put up, uh, to develop the streetcar system. The downtown, which was uh, you know, a very down and out kind of place, is now a very attractive, well, use place, and of course, as a corollary to centering with the streetcars, they have urban growth boundaries, open space uh, patterns that keep the city compact. And this is the Regional Plan Association of New York trying <laughs> to do the same thing in its kind of greenfield, transit-oriented development where the nodes of transportation define you, or the nodes of public transportation this is, again, putting transit on track is one of the major, major points in all this, and changing the mindset that says uh, we invest in roads, we subsidize, high, uh, we subsidize public transportation, which is patently untrue and pernicious. We should be saying that it's time we've spent the wad on highways, we should no longer subsidize highways, we should invest in public transportation. And of many kinds, I mean, not only rail, but buses. I mean, this is, you know, we've got a, an infrastructure that is already existing on the fringes. We can't, unfortunately, undo all the damage, but we should have paratransit taking elderly for rides, um, school buses we al already have, jitneys. There, again, it's a thinking cap kind of situation that demands not rocket science, but a certain amount of intelligence and new kinds of consideration. Um, 
And uh, you know, certainly we need to deal with the nation's rail system, which is a tragic disgrace. Um, it's, it's not only destructive to the auto age, but it's making us, and I didn't realize, this had, was not happening when I wrote the book. I started the book in 91 and finished it. It came out this spring, so it was done a year before that. And either the timing or my kind of uh, obliviousness to this issue, we, every place I go now, there's a little auxiliary airport that they want to put up. And of course, nobody wants to be under the airplanes. But the basic auto air age piece of information that's really worth considering is that 30 or 40 percent of the trips out of the nation's hubs, whether it's Detroit or Chicago or Boston, are within 500 miles. And that is you know, a nanosecond for a rapid train, so that you could be going between these places very quickly. And some places are trying to do this, but it's an alternative to planes that are not real pleasant and drivers who are now driving 12 hours rather than you know, deal with the assaults of being in the air and bad air and crowded seats as the airplane situation gets worse all the time. In my own city, um, I show this. We are about to have a three-hour trip between Boston and New York. It's been five hours classically. And this is especially fascinating because in our airport, 35 percent of the traffic out of the Boston airport goes to New York. So what are they doing? As this, this is due in about two years. So as they're building this Amtrak train that's just been an eternity coming, they are expanding Logan Airport. I mean, you know, the left hand and the right hand. Um, these things are just so institutionalized that it's very difficult to deal with. So I'm about to move on to a, a little more optimistic approach as we wind up here. Um, this is a call for depaving America. Some people are actually doing it. Uh, this is Providence, Rhode Island, that the uh, river that was covered by a highway and is now, has now been de-asphalted and the river let in again and has become a very attractive community place in the summers. And again in Boston, a garage that was a parking lot that was buried for a park, Post Office Square. So how do we do this? I mean, we do this through political activism, we do this with planning, through zoning, and we do it finally for being recog recognizing the place, price and recognizing the subsidies and writing the price. Um, this is, it, at some levels, it's a no-brainer. It's a, there's a lot of choices of how to do it. There's, of course, the gas tax. Unfortunately, I'm not running for mayor, governor, or president. But you know, why should we blame it that some places have already installed, have raised the gas tax to pay for things that they needed? If we don't want to do that, we can pay. We can pay for congestion pricing. We can pay for a carbon tax. You spew more. You consume more. You pay more excise tax. There are a lot of ways to do this, but it is a very, it is not rocket science any more than the fact that we pay for our telephone bills by the amount we use them. Those who use should pay. And the object in all this is uh, to keep America from being uh, a total spaghetti factory um, of roads as we go down the future. And I don't want to trash all our cars, um, even though it may sound that way. I think we have a long way to go in all these aspects of the automobile. But I would like us to take advantage of, of the subway. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that would all lead to the end of, if not completely airbrushing the automobile, uh, making our landscape um, softer and more agreeable. So I'd like to conclude by uh, reading kind of a summary of the book for my pains of spending five years on this. I get to read my own wonderful words and then maybe fielding some questions. So um, I conclude by saying this is not a proposal for nostalgia. It is a search for creative forward motion to shape the way we transport ourselves and hence live. It is a quest for the connecting of lives released from mobile steel cages 
and a questioning of the notion that the American existence is, I move, therefore I am. Instead, we must endorse the value and excitement of both passage and rootedness, the end of the rail, not the road. We need no longer find new frontiers off the exit ramp. We can find them on old lands renewed and human mobility restored. The way to stop the auto age begins with affirming the value of place and the role of transportation in easing our access to it. The mission is to make the very root of transportation sound like the word transport that can carry us to a better place and state of being. Thank you. So if we can have some lights and if anybody wants to um Nope. Ask some questions. We can sit with, would you rather sit, sit with the um, picture of Asphalt Nation? Oh, we have lights. Okay. Well, I will come forward now that I, can you see me? <laughs> in the I'm in the dark? Yeah. What can I do? <laughs> Oh, this is this is the the switch. Okay, you want to turn? Yeah.